Tom Whittle, welcome to Hey Shower. Welcome to Hey Shower. Hello, Hugh. Thanks, Sam. Another, another, um, another reg vlog on. When I when I started this, when I started this, when I started Hey Shower early on, I wanted to go for. A, you're not aware of this. Right? I, I want. The, I don't know. I don't know why you would be. I'm just making the point. We haven't. We haven't spoken about this before. But I, I wanted to have like an eclectic, not eclectic, a wide variety mix of guests on. And it was. Yeah. It was predominantly. It was at the start. It was just all military guests. But what ended up happening, randomly, it was all bootnecks. I don't oh. think I had a reg bloke on. I don't think I had a power reg bloke on until. But it was like a year in. I've been recording for like a year. Not one reg bloke on. It wasn't intentional, but I used to get paranoid thinking, what the bloke, what? the blokes who do watch this, the reg bloke, what, what are they thinking? It's like, it, he has every other, ca every cat badge except for, except for power reg on. And, uh, and now I think, I think the bootneck still, still leading the way in terms of guests. But however, you're a reg bloke. This is good. It's good for the people who moan about it. There we are. <laughs> you were talking on the, um, you were talking on the icebreaker about, when I asked you about what, what you're currently reading, you mentioned you, you mentioned about you, you feel a, a strong need to challenge your perception of things or maybe your belief in things. So that I, why do you think that's important? Is that to validate what you think? Do you know what? That's a really expensive question. Uh, I think I think for me personally. The antithesis of challenging yourself is what Tony, Tony Robbins said. And he said that if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. And I fundamentally disagree with him there. Because if you do what you've always done, you'll only get what you've always gotten if the situation around you changes, uh, stays the same. But the more that I work in different sectors and spheres and speak to people, I can see the situation around us is constantly changing. And so therefore we need to constantly change. And so all every day, my perception needs to be, like you say, confirmed, or it needs to be changed. It needs to grow. And so I'm just constantly trying to either check that I'm roughly in the right lane or to expand my perspective. If that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Although I think, oh, I think you should try and expand your perspective on things anyway, regardless. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and 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 yeah, you mentioned this on the iceberg as well. Is that that can be uncomfortable? It can be uncomfortable. It, it is. Oh, in fact, I find it uncomfortable most of the time because I don't want to read something that indicates. I've been wrong in my thinking, or that opinion mm. that I held was wrong, and this and the fact of the matter is that happens all the time, and it's actually even worse when <clears throat> maybe I voice that opinion on a podcast that was there for the historical record. Like, oh my god, I was, what was I saying two years ago, three years ago, whatever that opinion I held about the, the, this, that, or the other. But then the value of that increasing your uh, yeah, sort of yeah, increasing your your. Uh, well, your knowledge about stuff in general, right, or specific air aspect, of whatever it may be in life. We were talking about diet yeah. before. You were talking about, I think you were talking about philosophy and things like that. Is that um, it arms you for future future thought that you may need to do, or for opinions that you may need to make that you don't yet know you need to do. Mm. <laughs> if, that, if, if that makes sense. In fact, knowledge is knowledge is power. As, as ridiculous as that sounds, like knowledge is power. I try. I think a lot when I'm when I work. I work in project management, right? Mm. And I think a lot about. I have thought a lot about how we ex-military and parachute regiment or whatever cap badge you're from, frontline soldiers anyway. How we were, how we were so confident and as commanders, how we were so confident and capable as commanders i think how are we like in the most volatile of situations where anything can happen almost anything can happen when you're engaging with the enemy but we always knew what we needed to do always regardless of what the situation was and i put it down to well you could like training is obviously a big one but we it was knowledge it's like we we knew because of extensive preparation it'd be that practical preparation theory you know reading or doing um we knew what 
we had to do, or what our, be- our most likely, uh, the, the best the best path forward was in, the order, in order to increase our chances of survival and achieving the mission because of all the knowledge we built up about what could possibly happen and all the options we had at our disposal, our disposal, what the enemy could do, what they were capable of, what we could do, what we were capable of, where people were, what the what the environment in which we were operating was like, things that were to do with the enemy, that external, as external influences. And um, it's the same, it's the same, it's the same in life, right? Um, and, I, and that's kind of, when I was thinking about that, when I thought about the past, that's when the knowledge is power kind of made sense to me. Yeah. In a, in a, in a, in a not corporate business, um, world economic forum kind of way, but in a practical kind of way, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I mean, what you said there about um, changing your mind from something you said on a podcast a year, two years, three years ago, an opinion. So like in, in Parliament, the, the Prime Minister, doesn't matter who, it's, who it is, if there's ever the perception that there's been a small change, the opposition and the media will have headlines, big U-turn, you know, how did you not see this coming? And it's portrayed as a really bad mistake, a weakness. But for me, my approach is, if you're willing to change your mind, it shows that you're willing to accept new information and deal with your new reality. You know, you've got self-awareness to, to change. And, you know, the world's changing. Facts change. You get new information. You, as a, as a leader, you have to make the best decision with the best information that's available. And as new information comes in, you might U-turn and you might U-turn again. And, you know, I, I love the confidence of people when they say, I used to think this and I used to do this, but actually that wasn't optimum. And now I do this. It's, it's awesome to see. Yeah, I lost just slightly there, but I get, I get what you're saying. The problem is with the, with the politicians on that is that that, that game exists, but it's because they allow the game to be played. They allow mm. themselves to, to, they allow... They allow this situation where the media goes for the gotcha moment and they try and avoid the gotcha moment, which just make it makes it ridiculous. I have one hundred percent I'm 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 not I don't feel guilty at saying this. I have one hundred percent in the past fantasized about being on some chat show as a politician, because it pisses me off. Being on some chat show as a politician and they go, hang on a minute, two years ago you thought this. But now you think this. And I blah, they go, Yeah, I changed my mind. I change my mind because I learn more since. I don't think the same thing. Like, yeah. what you know, what what's the problem? And just and then hoping it would go into that area of conversation, and I could just gotcha them. So you've never yeah. changed your mind. You know what yeah. I mean? Do you still think the Santa Claus exists? No, because you learn more information and you change your opinion on whether Santa Claus exists. And now you don't think Santa Claus exists. The same thing. But they do. They they allow it themselves. They don't know. They don't want to be. They don't want to be gotcha, and it pisses me off. It's like. You, in fact, I think you just said it there. It, it's an admirable quality, right, mm. to be able to to be able to accept that your opinion has has, has changed, and at some point in the past, you were wrong. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's but I, I don't. I, it seems to have got that seems to have gotten worse with uh, with the rise in the use of social media. I think, and just the digital technology age, if you want to call it that. I think, yeah. and, you know, there's probably a bunch of reasons why, but it's definitely not good. And I think the politicians, they should be, they should be leading by example. Mm. You know, they should be showing, yeah, I want to go out and get, gather information. And I'm going to be open and honest about what I think and why I think it. Not skirt around things, dance around questions, just be open and honest. I'm very annoying, very frustrated. Fingers crossed for the future. So what's the... um? What are you still left? Yes. You can't help it. What? I've still got you. Have I got you? Have I got you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, my head Sorry. just um, my head's still. My eyes stay still as well. A little bit too long. <laughs> what? So what's the? Uh, so what's the? La- what? What are you? What was the last major thing that you were trying to challenge your perception on or opinion on? Or your knowledge on? 
Wow. Um, I don't think I don't think there's a a single concept, but I think that probably in in the line of work where you're dealing with multiple stakeholders and people with egos and kind of moving between different um, different priorities of different stakeholders. The, the biggest thing that I'm constantly trying to battle and maintain is my self-awareness, how I've come across to someone. And that's, you know, you can, you can go and do a job somewhere and then you inflate certain perceptions of yourself and you think I'm now really good at that or I've been coming across this way. And so for, you know, for me, for the, the, my colleagues and teammates that are working in these environments, being extremely aware of the effect you're having on people and how you're coming across is something that you have to fight for um, because it, it's easy to say, you know, I engender trust. You know, that's just me naturally. Um, I have natural authority. That's me naturally, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, you're not going to in all situations. And so I'm trying to look at the micro messages of how I'm changing and, and trying to just keep ahead of that self-awareness bubble. <laughs> which is difficult. Is there a danger there that you can, that you can, um, what's the word, uh, you, through overthinking things or overanalyzing things that you can stifle progress, or, not progress, or inhibit, or inhibit, or, yeah, it's uh, not, not par it's like a paralysis, paralysis, isn't it? They can, you can stifle yeah. yourself and reduce what you want to do because of the yeah. fear of, like a, a fear of risk or messing something up. Yeah. And also, if you get the balance wrong, you can you can come across as inauthentic. You know, if you're really worried about coming across too strongly, then you become you change your communication style. So it's a really, really tough battle. And it's something that in the military, I had a quite a I was very direct and I had a transactional communication style. I completely had to change that. And I had some really really difficult lessons. Um, my first foray into working outside the military sphere in Africa, I, I learned a really hard lesson. And I was like, I am not self aware, you know, in in that in that mindset of, you know, we're important, we're elite, people are there to enable us, then yeah, you might you can you can get away with being fully transactional. And I wasn't aware of what longer term influences that had. Yeah, that makes total sense. Actually, um, I get what you're saying. I, I, do you know? What I think that is. I think that transactional leadership style, that transactional communication style within the military. I think that's because that's the kind of that's the kind of methodology it it uh, it cultivates. Because when you when you're in, regardless of where you are, the expectation is. The expectation is through your own through your own experience of someone being led. So when you, when you become a leader, you, the expectation is that if I say this, they have to do this. Yeah. There's like very little thought for. Okay, if I say in this way, I may get this done, but it'd be a higher quality of output, higher quality product, higher quality service. You know, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm corporate speaking these things that I talk about military. They will do yeah. the job better if I do it this way. If I treat yeah. them, if I speak to my subordinates in this way, generally, yeah. if I in if I uh, if I make sure I encapsulate all of these good qualities about what we think, how we think a leader should act, do uh, be perceived by their followers, then they are more likely to do good work in the future and less likely to have problems. You think you need to think about that less in the military compared to in. A civilian world you know this and you know i've been converted you and i have it that is also a difficult lesson to learn definitely a difficult lesson to learn i'm doing a lot of leadership and um leadership stuff at the minute i'm studying a course uh loads of leadership stuff at the moment and it's making me and it's making me think back to the military when i was leading then exactly yeah. what you brought up there but exactly what we're talking about now and i think oh, definitely could have done i could have been a better leader in times there yeah yeah 
with sometimes you just think it's small tweaks other times there's like major things you're kind of definitely just and, and i mean lead it like people leading i don't mean tactical decisions you know yeah. it's like motivation of the troops basically yeah. um but i th- i don't know i wonder maybe the the military seems to be moving towards more towards like a more modern way of thinking they definitely are when it comes to physical training right mm. yeah but, I wonder if they're doing the same thing in terms of leadership. Although it's a it's a it's a fine balance to strike, isn't it? Between, uh, yeah, the, the the all of those traits that in the civilian world they go, this is what a, how a leader should act. You know, transformation and leadership is the buzzword at the minute, or as we the last few years. Isn't it? Transformation and leadership, and uh, motivating your staff to go forward and do well and and and, and be happy in their work to. Uh, to be, p- produce better things and treat the customer better. There's a fine balance to strike with that same attitude in the military to also, no, if I say something, you do actually need to fucking do it, regardless yeah. of how I said it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so what you've, what you've just touched on there is being, recognizing the strengths and the weaknesses of the different approaches. And I can't remember who said the quote, but understanding the rules like a scientist so you can break them like an artist knowing when to use which leadership style is absolutely imperative and it goes back to self-awareness one of the one of the big things that i do with the leadership mentoring you know in africa and for commercial organizations is enabling someone to move away from leading by their position or title so that people will follow them only when they have to to actually changing to people wanting to follow them, not because of their title, not because of their position, but leading because they want to. So changing that, they have to follow you to they want to follow you. And you know, that's all about trust, communication, self-awareness, long-term vision, joint teamwork, collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it, it's, it's transformational. It's the, the big value add that, seeps into every single part of an organization. Yeah, I just tying it back into politics. That's one of the major one of the major problems I see with, I see with politics and my politics. So oh, I, I, think, I think my trust in British politics and politicians is going down the pan at the moment. And it's the same in the US, it's the same in a lot of Western countries. And I think that's because, um, well, it's definitely the US, definitely Canada, definitely the UK. And I think it's because the leaders are such poor examples of leaders. These are such poor examples of leaders. You know, poor mm. examples of leaders to other politicians and poor examples of leaders to the nation. It is shocking because of things we've already touched on. You know, they're not willing to be open and honest about why they think what they think and that maybe they've changed their mind in the past or, you know, yeah. um, being, being transparent. And uh, so not only that, the mistake. I feel sorry for the politicians and I know that that's a controversial opinion but so the way that the why the reason I feel sorry for them is there's a benchmark here at the moment of visible wins and you know all those things that they can put in the media and they can say this is a short-term victory this is the standard but you and I know that most good leadership is all the behind the scenes the invisible stuff And so if someone actually came in and said, you're not going to see any good progress, I'm going to work on the invisible stuff. And so my visible wins is actually going to be way down here. The general public are going to be like, no, I'm not re-voting for you. And so our system actually rewards short term thinking. And that's the downside of democracy. And it's the, you know, it's the upside of an autocratic dictator. Not that I'm again. Not that I'm for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I agree with what you're saying to some extent. Although I don't think that the system is always is always like that. No, I think there are times when it's not like that. But again, the politicians or the whichever party is in power, they still play the game like it is. That. And the reason I say that is, I'm, I'm going to mention it. I mentioned a name, you know, people, people hair in the back of the neck will stand up. Dominic Cummings. The reason I say that is reading, reading Dominic Cummings articles and 
he does he releases maybe <laughs> one every four weeks eight weeks 12 weeks right? and i was i'm i was sort of cummings opinion agnostic before i started reading this stuff someone put me onto it uh, gaz welsh actually another red bloke from the Sinita's guild and in in dominic's articles he, he, most of them well, a lot of them are talking about historical stuff, decision, how politics really works, as he put it, what happens behind the curtain. And one of the things he he is he was repeatedly frustrated by um, when he you know from the last time he was in government and before is when they exactly as you said they are playing to the news cycle instead of playing a longer term game when when a party comes into power and they've got potentially four or five years before the next general election, they've got all that time to lay the groundwork. They can early on in that cycle, in that, uh, in that, yeah, that cycle, early on, they can, they can tweak things or make major changes behind the scenes or structurally, whatever they want to do it, um, which don't, which don't produce any big, obvious quick wins in the public eye, but will have massive impact down the line. For, for good purposes, but also nearer to the election cycle, you know, like re, like big reforms of different departments and things like that, or the or entire overhaul. Mm. Um, but they don't do that. They don't do that when they have the opportunity. Instead, like you said, they are looking literally to the next news cycle, which right now is the next day, sometimes shorter than that. So they can't yeah. achieve anything. They can't achieve anything of substance. It's absolute yeah. bollocks. And when you can't achieve anything of substance. Actually, those big wins that they look for are not even anything tangible. They're just bit, the, the big win is how are we able to slander, not slander, how are we able to make the opposition look look stupid? What yeah. did they do? Which individual has has had this personal problem or which individual has been caught, caught driving, I don't know, speeding? Which individual has got an expenses like claim yeah. that is wrong? They're not even producing anything tangible for for the, the nation uh, no. because of the reason you said, but they don't need to do that. They don't need to be always playing to the to the media, but they do. But the, I, I don't see how you can change that at the moment because the media drives their behaviour and the politicians accept it and don't see that they can change it. Mm. You know, it's their it's their action and the way they behave that allows the media to do what the media do because the media's got different interests. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's a vicious cycle. There's no real clear way to change it. No, no, I don't. I don't see it. But one of the one of the one of the major ways it can, it can be changed is, which we talked about it already, is be, behavior of politicians when they're being interviewed, when they're being talked to, when they're given a a, a, a briefing, when they're given a um, a talk, or whatever it may be. I think a behavioral change actually. If you were just open, honest, and transparent, that would be that would be a turning point. I think the, the media would have to engage with them in a different way. They'd have to engage with them like these people, actual, actual, honest, respectable people, like they do with most of the time with upstanding, respectable scientists when they're talking about something. You don't try and shoot them down and catch them out unless unless it's on some topic like COVID or I don't know. But anyway, anyway, we digress. We digress. How did you um how how did you end how did you end up where you are now? So, and I mean geog I mean geographically, but on the continent. I don't mean the grid square you're in right now. I mean the continent. How did you so? How did you end up from going from Power Edge to into the conservation industry in Africa? Hmm. So, I. I did law at uni and then worked in competitive intelligence um, for a, a London firm. Uh, and that's obviously very different law, competitive intelligence. And I did that so that I could make sure absolutely that I, I didn't want to go down that kind of avenue. I got to, um, got into Sandhurst and um, I was terrible. I think I mentioned when we spoke before, I was absolutely terrible. I was a terrible uh, officer cadet, a terrible recruit. And it was down to a couple of my good mates that I managed to scrape through uh, and, and again, luck. 
And I remember at the end of the first term, you have an interview with the, the platoon commander and it's about, you know, your choice of regiment that you want to try and get selected for. And I got told the first thing that the platoon commander said was, Officer Cadet Whittle, I need you to listen to me very carefully. The only thing that you are good at is making the foreign cadets look good. Do you understand? <laughs> and, and I mean, he may have believed it, but it gave me the impetus to drive forward to try and learn um, at a faster rate than everyone else. And I ended up the next term putting three para as my first choice and two para as my second choice. And I got in trouble because you have to put two different regiments and you're meant to put one, you know, one that's very selective parachute regiment and then one reserve backup. So I, I got in a lot of trouble and they said that I was making a mockery of the selection process by just putting two battalions rather than different regiments. And I said that that was my only aspiration. I don't need a plan B. Like if I'm not, if I'm not going to achieve that, then I don't think this, this place is for me. So I put all my eggs in one basket and thankfully someone got injured who probably would have been selected ahead of me. Um, and then they had to fill the spaces. So I, um, I got in. Um, again, a bit of luck. Um, and then had uh, about seven years uh, in the military and I was, I was never going to do a, a full term because I crave autonomy. I absolutely crave autonomy. And in the military, I was really lucky because I had amazing bosses and I had re a really good team in every single job that I had. But I was always, oh, I felt like I was boxed in. So I, I, did, I got an injury um, on, a, on a course and um, the timeline for me to get recovered and then do what I wanted to do um, was a bit too long because I basically wanted to be out by the time I was 30. And so I started looking outside and I had no real interest in conservation. I, um, one of my good friends, Andy Crichton, who's, who's now a director of uh, Frontier, he invited me down to his wedding in South Africa. And he was running at the time a, a charity where volunteers would go in and do stints in Kruger National Park, which is the big national park on the east of South Africa. And these volunteers would man assist radio systems and video systems, help with the surveillance and um, help protect the rhino. And I, I was there uh, for two weeks and it, it was that two week stint where I kind of realized that I wanted to go into conservation or do some work. And it, it wasn't because I enjoyed it. I basically, one night I was watching the video and I could, it was for one sector that had the rhino in. And I saw a couple of people that looked like, it's not clear, but they looked like they were carrying weapons. And so the action that I had to do was to phone the, the sector in charge, the ranger. And I phoned him and he came and had a look at the video. He didn't know who I was really. He just thought as a volunteer and they had a whole array of different volunteers. Didn't know my background, et cetera, et cetera. Probably just thought I was some one, you know, one of these do-gooders <laughs> from, from the UK who wanted to come and be in a national park. Um, and I was there to try and learn and take in as much as I could. And, I heard him on the phone next to me briefing his team on a plan to try and intercept these, these poachers. And again, a bit of my ego, I said to the guy, I was like, you know, I've been looking, I've been watching them for two hours, their movement. There's this piece of ground that would be a really good observation point where you could <laughs> put in a couple of guys now and you'll be able to maintain observation if we, if we lose the video tracking. And, you know, this bridge is a really good intercept point. And he looked at me and was like, yeah, cheers. Uh, I've actually done two months of ranger training. Um, I don't need advice from a volunteer, but thanks. Leave it to the big guys. And obviously I was like, I felt like I'd been slapped. And anyway, what happened happened. There was, um, it wasn't a successful mission. The guys got away. I spoke to one of my friends and I was, I was like, this guy, I can't believe it. 
you know, there's really obvious ways to improve here. And he just was not interested. And my friend completely reframed it and said, Tom, are you telling me that you didn't have the influence or the <coughs> persuasion ability to actually influence him? You were just relying on your, your previous title or your rank. And I was like, again, boof, boof. So I failed. Um, and <laughs> I spoke to the guy, Andy, who actually ran the charity. And he was like, that's conservation, mate. Like, people are not going to listen to you based on what you've done previously or your title or whatever your CV says. They're going to listen to you if they trust you and if you can influence and provide personal benefit to them. And so I saw then a opportunity to have a positive impact, not by being an alpha military, you know, shouting Breck and Chop, but actually by developing and getting people that were emotionally intelligent, but had the right skills to come in and partner and enable the success of these local rangers. And so I spoke with um, Andrew, who was running that charity, and I kind of started as an individual consultant, a contractor, did some work in DRC, Zambia, and basically me and a few other individuals um, under my um, kind of direction merged with the shell of a charity that had kind of wound up by then um, with my mate Andrew. And that worked nicely because Andrew is, he's, he's a man of absolute integrity. And so he's one of those guys that you can trust without actually having to check anything. He was going to take care of all of the business and the charity administration and make sure all of that was correct. And I was able to lead on a deliver, delivery throughout the, the continent. And so we kind of formed this partnership and that's how Frontier was born. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. No, it's, it's, it sounds really interesting. The, the auto, the, you mentioned um, you like autonomy at the start. Uh, did you know that you, <laughs> did you know that you, you, you treasured and crave autonomy before you went to Sanders? <laughs> Not really. I think, but I think maybe the same as you, you know, you start and then, and then someone's telling you, you know, your toothbrush needs to be pointing that way. And then it clicks like, ah, I've made a mistake here, but I think I can get through this and I should have more autonomy. And you do get more autonomy, you know, once you're, once you're actually doing the job. But I think I wanted more autonomy on when I was working, who I was working with. I wanted to choose where I could, where I was working and those lifestyle choices that the military can't really take into account. Probably similar, I don't, I'm guessing, for yeah, I mean, one's reason a bit. Probably similar, you're guessing, for what, sorry? For everyone's reason, whether it's one degree or 50, um, for the reason for leaving the military. Uh, yeah, I rec yeah, I reckon it plays a part into it, for sure. I just makes me laugh. I recounted this story to someone. You know, when you remember things back, like how the military influenced you and how impact it had on you. And I remember something back. But I've, I've remembered it a few times since I left, but I've never really thought about it in depth. And it has to be to do. It has to be to do with autonomy. I it's the most, the most ridiculous thing ever. Behavior that I had when I was I was quite early on in my career, and in the in the camp. Uh, in Hyderabad barracks at the time, yeah. the, the the showers in the shower block. It was the shower where you press the button, and after I don't know thirty seconds or whatever, the, the shower would stop. Yeah, right? <laughs> this is the most ridiculous thing ever. I get in the shower, right? And if I if I if the shower went off, so the shower stopped, whether I finished washing or not, <laughs> I would have to. Let's say I was ready to get out, I would have to turn the shower back on, and then get out myself while the shower was still on. And in my brain, it, because it was this, I'll decide when I'm going out of yeah. the shower, not anyone else. Like, <laughs> so even if I finish washing, the shower went off, and I have to turn it back on, then walk out. Like, my decision. That has to be something to do with autonomy. That has to be something to do with it. I was thinking about it the other day when I came up with a conversation. I was, I was thinking how barking mad 
that's bad behavior. It's like that thought. What are you talking about? What are you doing? Why? Why is that? Is why? Why are you being driven to behave like that? Like, what are you missing? Mm. But that was early on, and it didn't. That when I realized when I was serving that that sort of little behavior, I stopped it. That's you know, irrational. But I was still. It was a. The point is, I was still doing it at some point, you know. But I, I haven't said that. No, I haven't said that. But Africa must be the place to be if you like autonomy. If you like autonomy, if you if you if you if you've got a goal that you need to achieve, right? You know, delivering a service, delivering a project, and you know how best to achieve that. And you've got, and you know that the boundaries within you have to operate. Uh, those control measures they're they're a bit wider than what would would be otherwise afforded if you were somewhere else in the world for example is that fair to say i think it depends on the country and the specific service that there's it can be yeah it can be the case in for example in in drc northeast drc um we've done a lot of work under uh a former a uh, former Brit military, very senior SAS officer, and he knows, he trusts, and he knows that, you know, if I give a task, then I can trust how it's delivered. And so for that, there's almost 100% autonomy. You know, it's Tom, this is what I'd like to achieve by the end of six months. Here's your team. Uh, let me know at a monthly feedback. Whereas... For other countries, there's very, very tight parameters on what you can even discuss, let alone what you can do. So I think it's massively dependent on the context. What do you mean what you can discuss? So, for example, one of the things that we do a lot of is leadership development. So senior, middle and junior leadership development. To do a leadership course, what you're saying is we recommend that there's a requirement for a leadership course. Therefore, there is improvement required or change. Therefore, currently, it's not optimum. Whoa. Not something that you can openly discuss until you've established trust, because what you're saying is there's a leader somewhere who is not doing a good job. And so you have to set the conditions and so quite a lot of our work isn't in the actual doing there's loads and loads of consultants and companies that can come in and do military training very very good military training i have a list of 50 providers there's very very few people who will be able to come in and engineer and set the conditions so you can actually do things that have the maximum impact and provide the most return on investment and those kind of things are the things that most people avoid. So, okay, you're not making good decisions as a leader. Your structure is not geared towards efficient command and control. You are not empowering the people below you. You know, all of these things are things that people generally avoid and we go head on into. Is that because it predominantly, it predominantly requires cultural change? Organizational culture, yes. That's what I mean. That's what I mean, yeah. Organizational yeah. cultural change, yeah. It, yes, that's that's what it leads to. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of ways of doing it. One is that you completely overhaul a, a unit or a force. The other way is that you start developing a modern approach and good leadership at a junior level, a team commander level, and then you see that he gets promoted and then you can, you know, you can push it from the ground up. And so what we try to do is we try and develop it at the junior level and then provide advice and a restructure higher up. So, for example, we, we were called in uh, in Zambia to develop. Basically, loads of money was going into um intelligence operations and it wasn't providing a good return on investment and they said okay we need loads more training they asked me for some advice and we did 
Frontier did an advisory um, project. And what we recommended was not just a load of training, but actually merging two independent silos, one that had the information and one that had the capacity to target the individuals. But the commanders of each of these silos did not want to give in. And they also didn't want to take risk. Neither of them, because the status quo keeps their power. And so there's there's loads of different um, approaches. But one of the things we had to do there was we had to actually say, if this project works, the risk is on me. All of the accountability for any failure is on me. However, the accountability for any success remains with you two. How does that sound? Yeah, let's do it. So you're responsible for any failure and we get recognition for any success? Yes. Where do we sign? So I then have to make sure that my <laughs> team are, and that's why, you know, self-awareness is so key is that for me then I had to make sure that my team consisted of people that had were able to control their ego because you are not going to get recognized for your success. And every small risk we accept. So it's a kind of weird system, but you have to work out what works within very complex personal and political dynamics. <laughs> yeah, that, it, it, it sounds like really interesting, interesting work, to be honest. I love the, uh, I, I love what I find most enjoyment from, I think, especially in my, my day job, is that in, interpersonal relationship development. Yeah. Uh, for professional purposes, uh, because much the same as well, you it must be even more extreme for you. But uh, as you know, over here in the UK, where I'm, I'm used to the culture, I'm used to people, I'm used to like visible cues or just the way way we interact. I, I understand people much better than I would if I was in a foreign country, for example. Um, is that? Uh, I enjoy trying to get people to do thy bidding. As sinister as that sounds, right? As sinister as that sounds, you know, if I need assistance in something, if I'm trying to, if I'm trying, in tr if I'm trying to achieve a goal, like I said, I'm a project manager, and I know that these people are all going to feed into that, need to achieve yeah. this goal. All these people are part of that. You can guarantee, as you just explained. Most of those people, no, no, not most of the people. There are people in that group of stakeholders that yeah. e either A, are not interested in, in being a part of what you need to achieve or B, don't agree with what's been, what you're trying to achieve, yeah. you know? And then you've got all, all the ones, all the other ones, all the other people who are, they could be a great asset to it if they understood it a little bit differently or if, if they, if, if they perceived you in a yeah. different way, you know, exactly, exactly what you're saying there. And I'd say do thy bidding as if it's really sinister, but it's, it, it's, it's, doubt, it's not sinister. It's like a fine line, right? What you're talking about here is a fine line between um, influencing people to mm. do what you, to, to help you along in the mission, whatever you're trying to achieve and manipulating people. Like yeah. what's the difference between influence and manipulation? Because it's a very grey area. It's not. It's not. A, it's not. A, there's not a clear dividing line between the two. I don't believe there is. You'll get. You'll have some people who describe uh, one one uh, one uh, definition for manipulation, one definition for influence. In the same way, you can have one definition for marketing, and one different one different uh, definition for propaganda, right? Yeah. Um, I think there's a grey area in between, and that grey area in between. The way you stay away from the sinister aspect of, well, moving towards manipulation, I think that all depends on how you're more, how how morally guided you are as an individual. You know, yeah. it's it's the difference between having a dictator in power and an incredible leader, you know, or yeah. a, a, a toxic CEO, or like a, the most inspirational CEO you can have. It's, yeah. it's where how how guided they are, how influential they are, and. Um, and, and where their moral boundaries lie, <laughs> which side of the fence yeah. they are. I, I actually got asked the question the other day and I couldn't give an answer because someone said, well, 
Hitler was one of the most influential people of the 20th century, um, you know, and that that's negative influence, but it wasn't manipulation. You know, he was inspirational and influential. So it, it's really difficult. <laughs> I think it goes like you kind of hit on then. It's back to the intent. You know, is there a positive intent? It's all you can go back to, really. It is, yeah. It's the, yeah, it's a good point. And, that, and again, Hitler's a really good example of, of those, of challenging your perception of what is, you know, who, who is influential and who is not. Who is who demonstrated good leadership at times and who did not, right? Because Hitler, what a nightmare. But to your point, you know, you go and watch. I, I watched some of his speeches right on youtube and this is within the last couple of years i yeah. the translations aren't on he's talking in german but my god can i see how people how people were inspired to believe what he wanted them to believe yeah. you know and have that party in power and i can see how he was critical um his his the way yeah his his personal skills and his his the way he Spoke the way he, he's, you know, is a bit how incredible an orator he was, was a key part of how Nazi Germany came to be and how that whole nightmare came to be because yeah. he was such an incredible influencer, right? And yeah. and a lot of that, oh, there's a, a buzzword I just used. He's an incredible influencer in a different way, right? Back in the day, yeah. but some of that, some of, a lot of that was negative, right? But a lot of a lot of it was re- very positive, and it's like when you think of the word inf- influence you think about and you think of the word leadership good leadership you think of it in a positive way which immediately makes you want to think when you talk about hitler you don't want to associate those things with him but they're definitely some of it was he was a nightmare on the whole but you go yeah. and watch him talking and imagine yourself being in the crowd you go i am believing anything that man says that comes out of his mouth if i was in that crowd anything he says i believe anything that comes out of his mouth because it, you just get riled up what he's saying. And I don't even understand German, right, as, as yeah. an example. I'm no Hitler fan. Just to clarify, I am no Hitler fan. I'm just making a point. <laughs> well, I, think, I think in 1938 or maybe even 39, Time magazine awarded him the you know man of the year. He was recognized by lots and lots of people as being you know, a transformational leader, uh, super modern, and it's only perspective and getting to terms with the actual reality where people, you know, flipped. (laughs) And that's probably a bigger mistake, Hugh, than you changing your mind two years on an opinion. I think Time Magazine probably had to issue a rather larger apology. (laughs) Yeah, it's charisma. A big part of it's charisma, right? You know, it's the but not overbearing charisma. It's the same. It's you can say the same thing about. Uh, I mean, I want to come back to frontier in a minute, but we got on, this, on the subject of influence. It's, you can say the same thing about Trump. You know, whether you yeah. whether you like Trump or not, it's the same. And I'm not comparing Trump to Hitler in this case like, at all. But the difference between Trump and Biden and Trump and his opposition is he he's got this self belief and he's got charisma that goes with it. He's just charismatic when he's talking. I'm talking about his public speaking, in public speaking. Yeah. Here. Same with where Hitler there. I can't speak for his behind the scenes leadership of the party or anything else, right? But his public facing, <laughs> like that, that public speaking, there's just charisma there. And the way they, the way that charisma comes, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is perceived is tied in with, uh, not integrity what's the word they just seem more they just seem to be more honest and, and transparent than than the opposition and yeah. we know that is not the case for Hitler we know that is not the case for Trump but it, it's not how they're perceiving the public speaking they seem authentic that's what they're looking for they seem more authentic than 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 the people they're competing with yeah um, because of that charisma aspect it's super important which is you know, uh, which is which is obviously why um, you you spend so much time or, or spend a lot of time looking at how people perceive you. You know, especially yeah. it must be much more important in a, in a role where you are an outsider. You know, the, the, 
in in Africa. You are you are not from you are you are not from that part of the world. You're not a part of the culture, and then you're an outsider coming in and trying to influence people for the better, for the betterment of their organization and 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 uh, the country in a wider context i suppose is that fair to say absolutely yeah yeah uh, and i think for me and also for my colleagues you know many of them actually if i'm being completely honest every single other person that works at frontier is better at the social skills um they're all better able to craft and maintain working relationships than I am. Um, you know, I have different, uh, slightly different skill sets. Um, but if I know that there's, a, you know, there's a particularly difficult aspect that I'm not covering, then I've got, we've got very, we've got good coverage in our, in our team. Um, you know, I, I use the example of uh, Ross, who's a ex Royal RSM, uh, I think he did ended up doing 27, 28 years. And he, I think I offended him. Uh, I hadn't, I hadn't worked with him before, but my a trusted colleague had recommended they'd work together. I'd done some small bits and he came into Zambia to do some work. And, you know, we, we were chatting um, at the end of a long training day. And he was, he was asking because, we have a lot of applications for roles because we we pay well um, because what we do is very challenging. It's not the normal basic range of training. And he wanted basically to understand why he had been selected ahead of, you know, people that were either more qualified, although hard to find. And I was very, very honest, perhaps too honest. And I said, you were hired because of your attitude, not your skills. And, you know, you can imagine a ex para reg Rupert saying to a Royal Marine RSM, you weren't hired for your skills, don't worry about it. <laughs> that, <clears throat> excuse me, that was a bit of a shock to him. But, you know, I opened up and I explained that it was, there's three things that I'm looking for. There's flexibility of your approach. There's your impulse control, because everyone has an ego. It's your ability to actually manage it and work out when it comes out. And thirdly, communication. And, you know, he was 100% on all of those. And so he was a really obvious choice. And the skills, even in the military, if you're 100% there, they're not directly replicable. And if you think I'm just going to take this and I'm going to plant it down in Africa, you fail. And I see people fail. So that flexibility of approach, generating consensus and buy-in, having a collaborative um, training plan with the local rangers who will understand the ground and some of their situational dynamics better and then having a joint plan is better and i, I constantly tell constantly tell the organizations we work with that a 50 percent plan that has a hundred percent buy-in is better than a 100 percent plan with only 50 percent buy-in and some organizations say no you know we don't want that but normally they they figure out after a difficult realization that actually buy-in is key. And so, yeah, that was a long-winded way of me <laughs> explaining. No, it makes, that makes total sense. It reminds me of a, it reminds me of a, um, maybe three or four years ago in corporate environment where I, th I, I hadn't thought about it like this until you just mentioned that, where the, they were, they were long range business planning. I say long range, it wasn't, you know, like three, three, three year, yeah, you know, relatively long range, I suppose, for mm. volatile industry, and and it was a three year plan, and the the, the leaders who were uh, all came together for a few days to thrash out this three year plan, um, to quite in depth levels of detail. Yeah, but it never came to fruition. Like they tried to implement it, it never came to, to fruition because I don't think anyone really understood it or believe that it was achievable. And I say that knowing that I, I was part of the planning process. I was there, for, I was not one of the leaders. I was facilitating the planning process. Yeah. But you could see in there that it, it was almost, uh, they they weren't really pay, paying enough 
giving it enough credence. It was almost like they were just going through the motions of we have to put this three year plan together. Let's make, yeah, aspirationally think about what we want to achieve and how we think yeah. we should achieve it. And it, like I said, it never came to fruition because, yeah. um, one, because it was done in quite a silent environment in that, in a closed environment where they were all deciding what needed to happen and go forward. Um, so there was no consultation with actually the people who actually do the work and actually probably have got all of the knowledge that really yeah. will help the formula plan, like the people on the ground, you know, well, I don't know. I'm assuming that you can, you know, a lot of the way, I'm assuming that a lot of the way your training course has been developed has not been in, in, in that silo isolated thinking of this is what we think, how these things need to be done and how, and what, and what effect it can produce. Um, it has been in done in, in consultation with and or drawing on lessons learned from, funny enough, rangers. <laughs> you know, the actual people who actually do the job on a daily basis, you know, yeah. from from their tactical understanding or understanding of what the, the poachers will do to their cultural awareness. The, less, yeah. the cultural lessons they can, they can, tran they can transfer over to you, that knowledge they can transfer over. It's really interesting. So... I want to um, just flick back to what you were just spoke, spoken about, but for the for the Rangers tactical things, there's lots and lots of modern tactics, you know, from as basic as fire and maneuver, you know, lots of range organizations are taught that you move forward an extended line, everyone fires. Fire and maneuver, even down to individual, has such a transformative impact. And so that's something that we, we bring in and often it doesn't get buy-in. Because, you know, how do you demonstrate its impact? And so we have to then actually show through demonstrations how it works, or we have to actually mentor it um, in some locations on the ground. And then when they gain confidence in one thing, they then believe you and there's trust. And so you can get them to try different things. So it, it kind of snowballs. And that's why it's really difficult as an individual to break into conservation because you don't have that credibility. So Frontier is lucky now. I used to think that we, <clears throat> the big win for us was the reintroduction of Rhino in DRC because it's, you know, it's on National Geographic, it's huge. But actually, when I reflected, the big win for us is that every single one of our clients has used us again and again and again. That's the big win is maintaining a five year relationship with multiple African governments and big NGOs. And it's because of that, that credibility that we, you know, we undersell confidently. And I, I was reading a, I'm segueing here, multiple segues. I was reading a, a marketing book about how, you know, one of the key skills that military, ex-military guys don't have is the ability to sell. I've actually flipped that on its head and I confidently undersell. And what I mean by that is people will come in and they say they can deliver up here. And when they actually deliver, you know, it's down here because they haven't understood the situation and they haven't appreciated a margin of error. What I do is I say, we can't compete up here. We will deliver down here, but I can give you a guarantee because we have done this here, here, and here. And this is the best that you're actually gonna get Go with these guys, try them, but focusing on the basics. And then normally we over deliver. And so, it, it, you know, it's kind of a psychological framing that gives us more and more credibility. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're talking about reliability there as well, right? Yeah. Uh, the, um, Hugh, what you mentioned earlier about the business planning in commercial settings, I, I haven't, I hadn't worked, you know, the first three years that I, I left, I was just working in conservation. And in 2022, someone reached out and they were reading some of the LinkedIn or Instagram posts, sorry, that Frontier puts out. And they'd been reading the text. I don't think they cared about the images. And the guy had just inherited a manufacturing company and asked for some leadership mentoring he called it um he'd inherited it from his father didn't know how to lead and I, I opened a box where i was like actually the same problems that we have in conservation 
you know, um, what you've just described, siloed planning without appreciating the actual operational reality, making assumptions that other people are then going to have to deliver. Those things, they exist in every sector. So it's not, it's not different problems. It's just a different manifestation that we deal with in, in conservation. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Again, with the added complexity that you're dealing with different, yeah, different, different languages, different cultures, different understand, different, different backgrounds. And that's normal. That's normal anyway, but it's just more, it's more, uh, it's more intense there, I think. Um, mm. Yeah. So what's the focus? What are you work? Can you talk about what you're working on right now? What you're focusing on? Yeah. Um, so we've got this year, we've got a few, a few projects. Um, we've just finished and might potentially be doing some more work for a big organization called African Parks. And they are a charity that do the management of national parks where governments themselves are not able to. Um, so I think I mentioned earlier, we have just finished last year a project where we designed the strategy uh, to enable this national park to bring, bring back Rhino to the DRC. So we've we've been requested for a number of um, a number of kind of follow on projects with other national parks to consult and help their develop their strategy. So I don't know whether it's worth covering that or going into this year's delivery. What's probably more interesting? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what this is. Uh, which one you would you prefer? I mean, the, to, to be honest, the, the, this whole the whole conservation industry is fascinating to me. Like it, it it seems to have been over the last few years that it's really ramping up in terms of awareness here in the UK amongst mm. ex-military getting out to go and do things. It's almost like it's the new circuit. I don't mean that in the bad way. The circuit, like yeah. circuit, the circuit, but. Yeah, it's good. It's a good thing. It's given. Yeah. It's given ex-military a. Uh, ah, huh, this is thing I can go and do, which isn't just going and carrying a weapon and driving around an armored vehicle in the Middle East, in Iraq, yeah. Afghanistan, wherever it is. It's like I can yeah. go and do the, it, get it into this industry, which is yeah, kind of yeah. similar to some of the places I worked in, and some of the, yeah, some of the places I worked in when I when I was in, in terms of it's different, it's hot, it's it's rewarding work, but it's not military work it's conservation it's like yeah. invaluable it's it, you know i so I, I like that it's getting this this, this uh, increased awareness in the uk so and i've got a so kind of a black hole of knowledge on the whole thing i've interviewed a few people before in the industry but i'm, I'm still i'm still learning so um so um it's up to you do you want to start with the drc start with the drc okay well i think for context broadly frontier do two things so we are called in by governments and other charities that run national parks and conservation organizations who don't understand what they should be doing. And so we give advice. And that advice can be an assessment as to what the actual situation is, what the reality versus what their perceived reality is. It can help them understand what capability they have in a certain area and it can help them actually work out how to make a plan. So that's kind of one, one strand, which I'll come back to for DRC. And then the second is the implementation where we've designed something and then they say, can you do it? Can you bring in a team and whether it's train a specialist force, mentor leadership, whatever it might be. So DRC is it's one of the most fragmented countries in Africa. And the really interesting thing is that each national park has quite significant autonomy. They, they're almost like the rangers are almost like the police and the military combined. They are a military force in DRC, but they are responsible for the security of the people. And so in Northeast DRC, we've done a lot of work uh, to enable the rangers to stop uh, large armed groups, uh, including the Lords Resistance Army, um, the ADF, the NAS, and various South Sudanese and Ugandan rebel groups that were coming across 
They'd attack villages, kill villages, rape and pillage, and then go back across the border. And one of the things that we've done over the last few years is develop, <coughs> professionalize the force and develop platoon commanders and a company commander. And so giving them an overall law enforcement structure and the ground tactics through lots and lots of live firing and mentoring of operations. So they have the confidence and they've now got a secure zone. About a year and a half ago, the general manager, the director of the park, um, basically gave us a call and said that he has been asked if he could reintroduce Rhino. And this was Garamba National Park. It's famous because it's, it's an area where there are all these armed groups. It's a terrorist's gold mine because the terrorists go in, kill elephants, take a village and use that to then go and buy more weapons and sustain themselves. So reintroducing Rhino, uh, it caused a big issue because people were saying, why would you reintroduce it here? It's the highest risk area. This project was almost being put on top of the park. They kind of wanted it, kind of didn't want it. So the director called us in and asked, can you do an assessment and work out how we can bring Rhino in and maintain their safety? What do we need to do? Come up with a plan. So myself and Andrew went in and we did an assessment. We came up with a clear step-by-step -step plan in and amongst the, the mush of competing priorities and all of the things that, you know, park directors and all of the operational managers are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And our job was to provide that clarity of this is where you are, this is where you need to be, and this is how you get there. This is what it costs, this is what equipment, logistics, the capabilities. We proposed it. And about six months later, they were unable to find anyone internally that had the capacity to lead that project or wanted to take that risk on. And so we got a call again saying, do you guys mind coming in and leading the project? Um, and one of the elements was developing a light mobility force where guys would be on motorcycles around this, you know, in, around this DRC national park in small teams on motorcycles we absolutely would be happy to come in and, and lead that project. So we went in, developed um, a lot of the operational structure and the processes, embedded a new force and trained them on, you know, light mobility tactics and all of that really fun stuff. Joined it all together, mentored them, and then handed over kind of operational control to the internal management team. And the rhinos arrived and surprisingly, none have been poached. And so it's kind of been a, the biggest high risk, successful reintroduction on the continent. And we haven't really publicized it because we're the guys that enable other people's success. And it's, you know, they've, they've, they've owned that risk and they've taken that. Uh, but it was a big, big project for us, which has led to more requests. So that we did a few other things last year. This year, we are working a lot in Zambia and there's, there's a multitude of projects. So I've just finished a two week leadership course working with very, very senior leadership um, across a charity, which was Conservation South Luangwa and the government themselves. Um, and the, the individuals attending that were from a CEO of a multi, multi-million pound company through to a warden who's responsible for hundreds of people. And, you know, the aim for those kind of courses is for me to provide some modern approaches to leadership, some self-awareness and some introspection, and also to facilitate communications between two different partners. And so it's, you know, really conceptually quite heavy uh, strategic work. We are also doing human wildlife coexistence training. So the same kind of skills that you use when you're training a ranger or developing a leader, personal skills and all the basic process structure leadership can be devolved into any team. And, you know, if you apply those basics, they actually work in any team. So we've now been asked to go and do 
community engagement team training. Um, so that's one side. I know I've just blabbered for about five minutes straight, Hugh. Does anything that not make sense? <laughs> yeah, it does make sense. I'm going to pause you because my bladder is going to pop. Give me, give me, give me, give me two minutes. <laughs> cool. Um, question for you. I think yeah, we've got about what maybe ten, ten minutes ish. Uh, what's the what's the biggest challenge that the conservation industry faces? Um, he, I mean, I don't know whether you want to talk about Zambia specifically or DRC specifically or in general in Africa. But what do you think? I think that there's there's about three things that are causing big negative consequences for long-term success. The first is we get our funding from governments. So the US government, European governments, they provide most of our funding. The way that they, and it goes via national parks. So the charities that work in the national park, they will partner with us, get funding from the US government, you know, pay for our services, and they also run the national parks with that money. The problem with that model, it's absolutely necessary, but the problem with the model is there has to be short-term metrics. And so kind of what, like what we were talking about at the beginning, those metrics are geared towards short-term impact. And so quite, quite often the metrics will be things like how many patrols were done that year. Okay. So. I am constantly trying to reframe this because conservation is unlike most other industries because you're not trying to sell a product for a specific amount of time. You're trying to do two things. You're trying to conserve the environment in the near term and you're trying to set the people up for future success so they can carry on. So there's two things. If you're only doing well, wow, balloons were just showing then. If you're only doing, you know, judging the amount of patrols, then actually, what, what are you thinking about? Well, I don't want to invest in my people with training. I don't want to do rotations where I show them different things. I don't want them to have days off and actually recover. And so the long-term sustainability is massively reduced. And so the first big problem is that short-term focus, which is driven by short-term metrics. The way that you can combat that is by developing a closer relationship with the donors and by them giving you a longer timeline and different metrics. That has different complications. And quite often I'm asked, can you come in and speak to this donor and explain some more, uh, a different type of metric that shows the invisible successes? You know, how do you measure if someone's a better leader in the short term? Well, you can't. And if you can't measure it, how can we give you money? And so you can see how difficult that is. Yeah. And then, yeah. And also, I suppose it's, you know, a lot of the, how, how do you prove, how do you prove because of those, all those small and difficult to measure um, variables, how, and the things that you were trying to influence, how do you measure how, how much of the bad stuff didn't happen because everything yeah. else was so good and improved. You know, you, you can't, uh, yeah. How do you measure how many, how many rhinos didn't get, didn't get poached? <laughs> you, can, yeah. you can't, you can't prove a negative, right? <laughs> no, super and, and even, even which leads on to the next, um, the next problem is there's so many variables. For example, a two week stint of no rain can destroy a crop which then has a spike on poaching. Well, maybe the national park is doing an amazing job, but because of factors outside their sphere of influence, they are now being perceived as failing. And so what do they have to do? They have to cancel the long-term plan and now become more reactive. So again, how do you combat that? You have to have that relationship of trust. Very difficult when you have changes in personnel changes in you know accountability lines <laughs> yeah. it's almost a wicked problem the, yeah. the 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 i've been lucky and you know frontier works with organizations that have to deal with those challenges day in day out 
but you can probably see now how understanding their context is absolutely key to how we design our programs. And so if you come in and you say, cool, what you need is a three month training with, and you need to buy a load of night vision and your problems are solved. It's, it's, it's not credible anymore. 10 years ago, you could yeah. sell that message. Not anymore. I think when I, when I said, uh, how do you measure, how do you measure, how do you measure how many rhinos didn't get poached? That well, obviously they're still all, all still there. I think what I meant was how many, <laughs> how many, how many people, how many poachers were deterred that you didn't know about were deterred that were exactly. going to attempt and didn't because, yeah, yeah. because, uh, yeah. yeah. So fascinating. I, it is it, interesting. Go on. For the, for the, let's say rhinos. Well, you can do a count and you can collar rhinos. So let's say you collar rhinos. You now know, because a rhino will stop moving, how many you've lost per month, per year. But if your measure of success is purely on outcomes, how many rhino have died? Well, then all of your focus goes on to the outcomes are you going to focus on what actually drives the success? You know, effective patrols, investment in your people, tactical planning, long-term planning. You're not. You are purely focused. And so often lots of my workshops are on having people try and step back and see a slightly wider perspective and start to have accountability, not just on the outcomes, which are really important, but actually what drives the success. And there's a, there's a really uh, famous psychologist um, whose second name I've forgotten, but Dr. Henry X, and he constantly talks about the problems. If you're held accountable for things that are just outcomes, then it's like, it's like a football coach focusing just on the goals and not on how you actually pass and play. You want to be focusing on how the team scores the goals, not just the goals. You know, down a rabbit hole of, of one of my favorite psychologists. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I lost it's, a, there, it's I, I, really I, complicated. I got the gist of most of what you're saying. But, and then I think, I yeah, I, um, I think it's worth summarizing, you know, you ask what's the problems. I think it's worth summarizing for 30 seconds on conservation and say, people are really negative and there's a perception that conservation is failing. I'm a optimistic realist. Frontier are optimistic realists. And we see massive improvement in people and we see massive opportunity to do more but we also see amazing progress in other places and so it's not lost and it's not that you know downward trajectory there absolutely is amazing stories going out there but like you were saying at the beginning they're not the the media hooks that often get put out there mm. yeah i don't know i'm not sure I'm not sure I, I perceive it like that myself at the moment, but then I don't, it's not an industry that I keep a, a you know, a tight grip on in terms of what's happening and where progress is being made and where, where it's not. Yeah. But, uh, but is that what, so you think that's the case? Where, where do you think that, that perception of failure is, is occurring then globally? No. Um, so there was a, a research paper that was done last year and it showed that 85% of conservation social media posts uh, had a negative connotation and only 15% were positive. And, but that is because, for example, populations of lion, elephant, uh, wild dog, uh, there's lots of declining populations. So the, you know, they have to publicize because that's how you get funding. And so, you know, a negative story will generate more funding than a positive story. So that's why it exists. Yeah, I was about to say that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's what, yeah. If, it, if it's all going rosy, people are less likely to think it needs to have, it needs to be funded, right? Either on a personal level or, or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I get it. I'd love to get out there at some point. I've, I've been out to, um, I've been out to Uganda and Mozambique and I, I just, you know, I, as you, 
as you know, and I think many other people who have visited that continent. My God, such an it's just such an incredible place, such an incredible yeah. place for a bunch of different reasons. It just I, I love it, and um, and you know it's uh, it's so diverse in in terms of literally the creatures that are on that continent. They like <laughs> just it's just an unbelievable. The humans are one thing, right? We yeah. are crazy. And Africa is full of amazing, different, we've, we've touched on it, cultures and peoples all over. But the but when it comes to um, non-human creatures, animals, the animal kingdom, it's a whole other level. It's a whole other level. And uh, I, I, it's, in fact, there's a few things I think people should do once in their, in their lifetime. For example, I think everyone should try some form of psychedelic in their lifetime. Another thing is, for example, people should go to sub-Saharan Africa. Go to sub-Saharan Africa, whether it's for a week, whether it's for longer. And, you, and it doesn't I don't think it matters where you go. I don't think it matters where you go. You go there and you experience it, and it is like nothing you will ever experience elsewhere. And hopefully you get to see some wildlife way there. And hopefully you get to spend some time with the people way there, wherever you are. You know, and it, uh, it, I, it, it literally can change your perception of the world and, and, and your yeah. own place in it when you experience something so different and so and so positive you yeah know? and uh, and I so that's 100%. why partly why the conservation industry industry really interests me as well as the fact that so many good people like yourself from from great you know from similar backgrounds to myself and from who achieve great things already then go out and try and make a big positive impact uh, uh like like you are and like frontier are doing you know and so um so I think on that, thanks for your time, mate. Thanks for your time and, and, and what you're doing out there. Um, how can uh, how do people keep track of what you're doing or, or or you personally, but also the company? Uh, we, we're we sporadic LinkedIn posters uh, and we do put little bits on the Frontier Instagram, uh, which is probably the best way to keep a track of our approach and our projects. And we have got some... TikTok we, video, yeah. We're not TikTok videoing. Um, <laughs> yeah, none of us, none of us are really that way inclined. We Instagram's a difficult one because you, you know, you're you're really adept now at communicating across media platforms. It it takes a while, doesn't it? And it's also very very time consuming. So it's difficult. <laughs> I am rubbish at it, mate. I am at terrible at it because it's time consuming. Yeah. Like I just. I just I, I, one is time consuming and two well it's time consuming yeah but putting the effort to put the thing together you want to get out there right and understanding what information you want to you want to want to communicate yeah i i i there are definitely times where i wish social media didn't exist and it was like back in the old days where you didn't have to worry about all that you could just post flyers through people's doors and put up billboards you know <laughs> that's it but yeah it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And um, next time you surf back to the UK, let's try and, let's try and RV. Um, and in the meantime, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks very much. I appreciate the questions, the interest, and the um, the exposure. I really appreciate it. Thank you. No worries. Go and get your, go and get your phone off the roof. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Tom. Thanks to you. Bye for now.